Sorry? All right, good afternoon. Um, in a short while, I will be joined by Gemma Connell, the head of OCHA's regional office in southern eastern Africa. She will be briefing us by telephone from Mozambique on the aftermath of the cyclones that have pounded the region. I will start off with a statement on Benin. Uh, the Secretary General has been following closely the developments in the Republic of Benin in the run-up to and aftermath of the April 28th legislative elections. He deplores the violence witnessed in the post-electoral period. He calls on all Beninese stakeholders to exercise maximum restraint and to seek their resolve, excuse me, and to seek to resolve their differences through dialogue in line with democratic traditions in the country. The United Nations, through his special, re special representative for West Africa and the Sahel, Mohamed Ibn Chambas, will work with all concerned parties in coordination with the economic community of West African states and other partners to support the Beninese stakeholders in their efforts to find a consensual and peaceful solution to their differences. That statement is available to you in French as well. And as you know, today is World Press Freedom Day, and this year the theme is Media for Democracy, Journalism and Elections in Times of Disinformation. In a message for the day, the Secretary General stressed that a free press is essential for peace, justice, sustainable development, and human rights. And his full message, I think, has been shared with you uh, earlier this week. For her part, Audrey Azoulay, the Director General of the UN uh, Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, said at the time of growing discourse and mistrust and de delegitimization of the press and journalism, it is essential that we guarantee freedom of opinion through the free exchange of ideas and information based on factual truths. The three day, a three-day event to mark World Press Freedom Day, jointly organized by UNESCO, the African Union Commission, and the government of Ethiopia, just wrapped up at uh, AU headquarters in Addis Ababa. And here in New York, there, is, uh, there was an event to mark the day in Conference Room 1 that wrapped up a short while ago that included a panel discussion. And just to note uh, on the African Union, uh, on Monday, the chairperson of the African uh, Union, Mr. Faki, will be here in New York for the regular consultations between the UN and the African Union, and the Secretary General and Chairperson Faki will hold a uh, press stakeout uh, on Monday afternoon, I think, uh, in the area between Ecosoc and trusteeship. Maybe I said something wrong. Yeah. No. <laughs> Whew. Just in time. Good job. Um, all right. Tear out this note. Um, uh, sorry, on, a, on a serious note, um, we continue to be concerned about the heavy fighting in southern Tripoli. There are reports of extensive use of airstrikes and uh, rocket shelling, causing more civilian casualties and destruction and forcing thousands more civilians from their homes. The Secretary General's special representative in Libya, Ghassan Salame, continues his outreach to Libyan interlocutors to, in an effort to de-escalate the situation. As I mentioned, he met on Wednesday with the President of the Presidency Council, Fayez Siraj, and with a group of elders, officials, and tribal leaders from the Western region. He offered the United Nations full support to help civilians affected by the fighting, including internally displaced people and host communities. On World Press Freedom Day, the UN mission in Libya is expressing deep concern over the threats, incitements, and violence Libyan journalists are increasingly, increasingly facing since the outbreak of fighting in southern Tripoli. Two journalists were abducted yesterday. The mission is also concerned about the increasing use of social media to incite violence and hatred. As fighting continues, the International Organization for Migration says that now more than 50,000 people have been displaced. Most are finding shelter with families or in other private arrangements, while 29 collective shelters are now in operation, housing an estimated 2,750 um, 2, people. Humanitarians are providing assistance at these collective shelters as well as other areas of displacement as, as access is allowed. 
More than 3,400 refugees and migrants are estimated to remain trapped in detention centers already exposed to or in close proximity to the ongoing fighting. The, available of food, the availability of food, water, health care has been severely restricted in these facilities for refugees and migrants. Some 32,000 people impacted by the crisis have been able to receive some form of humanitarian assistance to date. And in a joint assessment by the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Food Program has found that 10.1 million people in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea are suffering from severe food shortages, meaning they do not have enough food until next harvest. The agencies found that this comes on the heels of the worst harvest in 10 years due to dry spells, heat waves, and flooding, as well as limited supplies such as fuel, fertilizer, and spare parts. The assessment is based on missions carried out to the DPRK last month and in November of 2018. It found worrying levels of food consumption, limited diversity, diet, and families being forced to cut meals or eat less. The assessment recommends scaling up food aid to meet immediate needs to prioritize areas where food needs are greatest and climate impact are most severe. It also suggests expanding nutrition programs and disaster risk reduction measures to help people better cope with future shocks. And um, as mentioned by Monica, there was an event uh, on Sri Lanka earlier today. The Deputy Secretary General Mina Mohammed spoke at the event, and she expressed the UN's full and continued solidarity with the people and government of Sri Lanka in the aftermath of the attacks. She said that as a Muslim, she knows that her faith preaches peace and tolerance, and she added that tragically, yet again and again, the world is seeing places of worship becoming killing grounds and houses of horror. Churches, mosques, synagogues, and the religious sites of many faiths are being targeted for murder, arson, vandalism, and desecration, the Deputy Secretary General said, asserting that we must reject this form of violence. And Ger Peterson today met in Geneva with senior officials from Egypt, France, Germany, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Meanwhile, our humanitarian colleagues reports that through the 30th of April, nearly 7,700 people have left Rukban and have now been registered in one of the five shelters around Home City. In addition, 3,200 more people left Rukban yesterday and are arriving at shelters today. With the most recent arrivals, over one quarter of the original 41,000 people at Rukban have now left. The UN stands ready to engage more directly once granted full access to all areas and reiterates its willingness to be directly involved to ensure that core protection standards are met and that movements are conducted in voluntary, safe, and well-informed manner. While the UN was able to access the shelters last week to assess the situation, we are not able to provide regular assistance to those who are there. It is, however, providing being provided through support of the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, needs and shelters are extensive. We continue to call for safe, sustained, and unimpeded access to people in Rukban and in the shelters and their areas of origin, as well as people throughout Syria. Uh, <clears throat> on Myanmar, the Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator Ursula Mueller will travel to Myanmar from the 9th to the 15th of May. Uh, this will be her second visit to Myanmar in her current capacity. She will be in Yangon, Naypyidaw, as well as the camps in Kachin and Rakhine states. She will see firsthand the humanitarian situation and the impact of the ongoing conflict, and she's expected to discuss solutions for the displaced and vulnerable people in these areas, along with how to improve the humanitarian response. Ms. Mueller is expected to meet with people affected by humanitarian crises, senior government officials, and of course our humanitarian partners. Before being in Myanmar, she will travel to Jakarta to attend the ASEAN UN Committee on Permanent Representatives and Secretariat to Secretariat meetings. She will also meet with Indonesian government officials. Also on Myanmar, the acting resident and humanitarian coordinator there, Knut Ostby, is following with concern recent reports of escalation of violence and civilian casualties in Rakhine states. Mr. Ostby calls for calm and utmost restraint by all protection of civilians in all circumstances and respect for international humanitarian law and human rights law. The UN stands ready to support authorities in strengthening their prevention and conflict resolution capacity and to continue with provision of humanitarian aid. Um, today, the humanitarian coordinator for the Occupied Palestinian Territory, Jamie McGoldrick, and the director of uh, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, 
and the UNRWA, and UNRWA in the West Bank called for an immediate halt to the destruction of Palestinian-owned property in East Jerusalem. Demolitions in East Jerusalem have increased at a staggering pace over the last month, leaving tens of thousands of Palestinians displaced and others who have lost their livelihoods overnight. As of the 30th of April, 111 Palestinian-owned structures had been destroyed in East Jerusalem. Overall, more Palestinians were displaced in East Jerusalem in the first four months of 2019 than in all of 2018. That's 193 for the past four months compared to the 176 last year. Also, I had been asked a couple of times about the situation of Omar Shaker, uh, the Israeli and Palestine Director for Human Rights Watch, and I can tell you that we are concerned about the shrinking space for human rights defenders to operate in the occupied Palestinian territory. Israel must allow them to carry out their work without threat or intimidation. And I was also asked about uh, our colleague Monsef Kartas, and I can confirm to you that the Tunisian government has provided documentation relating to the legal proceeding initiated against Munsef Kartas in Tunisia. We're in the process of analyzing and assessing what has been sent to us by the Tunisian government. However, our position remains unchanged. The arrest and detention of Mr. Kartas was not in accordance with Tunisia's obligations under the Convention and Privileges and Immunities of the United Nations, and he should be immediately released until the matter is resolved. Um, I was also asked about Afghanistan and the Taliban and the United Nations. Um, I can tell you that, to confirm to you, uh, that Mr. Yamamoto, the Secretary General Special Representative, had met uh, in late April with Mullah Abaradar Akhund and the Taliban negotiating team in Doha. The meeting is part of a regular dialogue between the UN and the Taliban on human rights, humanitarian assistance, and the peace process. The UN mission conducts frequent meetings with all parties to the conflict as part of its good offices work to support the Afghan people and government to bring an end to the war. It has, over the course of the last several years, been engaged in regular meetings with Taliban in Doha in which peace efforts, the protection of human rights and humanitarian work to help the most vulnerable communities in Afghanistan are the primary focus. The UN mission advises all parties to the conflict of its regular contacts with the Taliban in key areas. Lastly, I uh, just want to flag that our wonderful colleagues at the UN Chamber Music Orchestra will be having a concert to honor the legacy of Notre Dame Cathedral. That will be on Thursday at 7.30 p.m. at the All Saints Episcopal Church. Um, and lastly, uh, but not lastly, um, we say thank you to our friends in Uzbekistan for their payments to the regular budget, which brings us up to 90 90. I answered myself, so. Uh, Masood. Thank you, Stefan. On this uh, t statement that you read out on on Palestine the territories and the and shrinking space for the Palestinians, uh, when is the Secretary General? Because Secretary General has one of the most powerful, what do you call, uh, moral voices is what we say. When will he be able to persuade the Israelis to abide by some of the uh, Security Council resolutions, which they are constantly flouting, and not well, to I be mean, said about Masood, the, the Secretary General, uh, I think, expresses his position loud and clear through his spokesperson, through the reports that he presents to the Security Council, through the... Um, um, through the briefings by his special, uh, his uh, political coordinator on the ground, so his position is is clear. As to the actions of other parties, that's not something I can speak to. Maggie, Steph, <clears throat> on the uh, WFP FAO report mm -hmm. on North Korea, does the SG have any concerns that perhaps international sanctions are adding to this problem of the food shortages? Because they mention. Uh, limited supplies yeah, I mean, of we, fuels, we have, spare parts, things yeah, like that. We, we have expressed our uh, our concern on, on that issue uh, and have uh, sent messages to member states to ensure that sanctions do not hamper uh, humanitarian activity. Part of the challenge, uh, in addition to all the other challenges, is um, the difficulties in accessing the banking system and getting funds uh, into the DPRK for our own operations. Yes. 
I have a question, uh, thank you, Stefan, regarding a tweet by the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of um, Taiwan urging Secretary General um, to ensure that Taiwan's members of the press are given UN media accreditation. And can you tell us why, what the reason is for them not being able to access the UN as journalists? Thank you. Any, anyone can access the UN premises as long as they have a passport or identification from one of the UN uh, member states. Uh, the United Nations view on, uh, on China is based on the relevant uh, uh, General Assembly uh, resolutions, uh, and I think the Secretary General has often um, stated his support for the uh, territorial integrity of China. Philippe. On Tunisia and the expert, did the Tunisia ask for a lift so for the humidity, well, we're, we're, the immunity of the experts? We're we're looking at uh, we're looking at what they've uh, what they've what they've sent us. Uh, so I'm not going to comment on that at this uh, at this point. Our position is clear: is that we firmly believe uh, that he is covered by the Convention on the Privileges and Immunities uh, granted to United Nations uh, staff and experts on mission and that he should be released uh, until the matter can be uh, resolved. Mr. Klein. Yes, do you have an approximate time on Monday when the stakeout you announced? I do have an approximate time, approximately after, in mid-afternoon, <laughs> what, what the English well, would probably call tea time. Okay, so approximately. But so I will give you, we'll give you the exact time, but uh, in time for high tea. Yes, sir. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, Stefan, to follow up the question I just made to Monica, to PGA, is about the situation in Venezuela. And since uh, April 30, where the incident happened with Juan Guaido and, and calling the militaries for, uh, I mean, to take off the regime in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. So yesterday, Nicolas Maduro marched with 4,500 troops and and to show a demonstration that house his power. At the other side, of course, Juan Guaido with demonstration of, of the, the Venezuelans. And five people has been dying since, according to the UN report, and including three kids, and more than uh, 300 people being injured on this, according to the human rights report from the spokesperson in the region. So my question is, what is the Secretary General uh, reactions on these regards? Look, we, we've, we've expressed our concern and continue to do so, especially uh, with the violence that we saw. I think, as you mentioned, our uh, colleagues in the Human Rights Office uh, underscored the, uh, the information about uh, people have been killed and died during these, uh, these demonstrations. It's very important that all actors in Venezuela undertake uh, immediate steps to try to lower tensions and refrain from any action that will lead to further escalation. And that includes uh, the, uh, our concern about uh, Venezuelan authorities take, seeking to restrict the political activities of the opposition, which we think could lead to an escalation of tensions. To follow up, uh, Stefan, and <clears throat> what is this, po this position again? Uh, because. Uh, the call is now for military intervention in the country, but basically the people in Venezuela is being killed from Maduro's uh, armed forces. So I, I, my question I, is, was the SG, uh, the Secretary General, reaction position in this situation? Uh, real look, it's for, a, it's critical that people on. be allowed to demonstrate freely uh, and peacefully, uh, and that a, uh, there needs to be a clear uh, effort to find a political dialogue out of this situation. Maggie. Uh, following up on Mr. Cartas, does OLA represent him in this sort of situation, or does he have to find his own lawyers? Well, and it's not about, you know, it, for, for us, uh, we are uh, in contact with him, right? Have you visited him? That was yeah, my we next have, question. Yeah, we have been in contact. We have seen him. Our colleagues in Tunisia have been able to see him. Yes, Carla. Thank you, Stefan. Um, why is there continued silence about Jeffrey Sachs's brilliant report, which attributes the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela to U.S. sanctions? I think, Carla, and I have no doubt you've been listening, but there's been uh, quite a lot of words, quite a lot of expression for concern 
at the suffering of the Venezuelan people, both inside the country and those who have left the country, uh, and for efforts to need for efforts to solve this uh, the humanitarian issues that are facing Venezuela. So, but. I, I, Carla, I'm not going to engage with you on this debate. Yes, Masood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pan. On this uh, situation in India, uh, uh, the cyclone, mm -hmm. 100 million people are in the path of this cyclone. And has anybody had a conversation with the Indian authorities, whether they need any help? Yes, well, we are uh, our colleagues in... Um, in India are uh, well aware, um, hold on a second, I don't want to, um, the UN uh, humanitarian agencies in, uh, in India have also met, uh, have met ahead of the storm's arrival to take stock of preparedness measures. While we wait, uh, I have a trip announcement. Uh, the Secretary General will travel to the South Pacific to spotlight the issue of climate change ahead of the Climate Action Summit that he is convening in September in New York. The visit, which will kick off on the 12th of May, will take him to New Zealand, Fiji, Tuvalu, and Vanuatu. In each country, the Secretary General will meet with government leaders, civil society representatives, and youth groups to hear from those already impacted by climate change and who are also successfully engaging in meaningful climate action. In Fiji, the Secretary General will be at the Pacific Island Forum, where he will meet with senior government officials from each member state in attendance, as well as members of civil society. In New Zealand, the Secretary General will meet with Muslim leaders in Christchurch to express his solidarity following the March 15th terrorist attack. And prior to traveling to the Pacific, uh, the Secretary General will be in Geneva from the 8th to the 10th of May to attend the spring meetings of the UN Chief Executive's Board, this is one of the semi-annual meetings that brings together, under the chairmanship of the Secretary General, the executive heads of 31 UN system entities. This session, which will be hosted by the International Labor Organization on the occasion of its 100th anniversary, will focus on the future of work in the digital age. The heads of the UN entities will also look to agree on ambitious and concrete steps to address climate change in advance of the September Climate Summit. While in Geneva, he will also address a special session of the World Trade Organization's General Council, where he will stress the importance of preserving the multilateral rules-based order, including on trade, for fair globalization and the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals.